the grief cycle is uh, talked about in stages. You know, you got the the denial, right? And then you got the the bargaining and the protest and the depression, and despair, and then you get to acceptance or resolution. And a lot of times it's talked about like, you know, these are sort of like, okay, from, from you know, uh, the first week we're going to go through this and the second three months we're going to go through this and it looks kind of like very discreet well as you know probably if you've been through significant grief it's, it's always not it doesn't really work exactly like that because what happens is two things one is we feel different emotions a lot of times um throughout time and secondly we we think we're kind of done with one but we'll recycle back through that's a really normal process that when you go through grief um, you're going to experience a lot of stuff a lot of stuff you know it's kind of like it's kind of like if you have the flu you know um, or you get some sort of bug you know for a little while you might have a fever is your most thing you feel the most and then the body aches and then you start coughing and then you throw up and what well, you thought you were through with the throwing up and then three hours later you throw up again. And then it just, there's a lot of stuff working through your system. Okay. Now, if you think about this, I want to talk about those five buckets, um, four or five buckets. How, how, there's, there's different models um, since Kubo Ross did this, but there's a lot of different states. Okay. And I just want to give a moment on each one and then we're going to move to your, your questions as you call in. Um, the first one is denial. Okay. Um, what is that? Does it mean that somebody doesn't, you know, they're liars. They don't want to face the truth. They don't want to face reality. No, actually what it is, is it is an, it's an overcoming of the system. Like you can't really, it, the harder something is the loss it, it, it's like it hasn't registered yet. It's like when you first see something, you don't fully comprehend it. Well, you might comprehend it cognitively, but emotionally, your emotions have been like just boom, and it, they're in shock. And in that shock state, it's like, no, this, 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 this can't be true. This, this can't, this isn't, it doesn't register. And so that kind of shock and denial is like, it's because we're just overwhelmed. And the deeper the loss, then obviously the more apt we are to, to feel that. And, and sometimes it, it hits us in a way that um, we do engage our minds to help deny it. You know, you see this a lot of times, um, people are losing a relationship, somebody's breaking up with them or a divorce or whatever. They're, it, they're really not comprehending that this is happening. And so it's hard to do that. Okay, that's denial. Normal, natural. If it goes on too long, though, we're in trouble. Okay, and it's sooner we can kind of get out of it, the better. The second one is protest. You know, the best way that, for me to think about protest in this, uh, in this instance, when you're hurting over something, is you ever seen you ever seen like on a you know if you ever watch dr i'm dating myself there or uh, maybe for the next generation sort of uh, next group of graduates <laughs> Grey's anatomy or you, you go through the medical shows right or the cop shows or whatever and there's always going to be this scene where where somebody's been taken to the hospital and they're working on them you can see through the glass door and then loved ones are there and then the doctors you know, pull the mask and they, they couldn't save the person. And the first thing you see from loved ones generally or often is no. And there's this immediate, this immediate, what's the word? Protest. That's the anger, the no, the fighting it. I'm not going to allow this. And the anger and the protest is the natural fighting back when something bad occurs, which a loss is. So a loss has a lot of anger to it, a lot of anger. Well, then the anger, you realize at some point, the protest is powerless. It's not working. It's not changing things. The person is leaving us, you know? 
we have lost whatever it is we're fighting. And when you get powerless, then you drop and we go down. And that's in that phase where the the despair is and the hopelessness and the darkness and the depression. And then there's a proper expression of all that because that's got to turn into mourning and grief. And then there's an expression of that. And once you begin to process that, you get to an acceptance and everything is kind of like, that's when you start to kind of like, you know, reorganize reality without this job or without this person or without that uh, business that failed or without that relationship. And we accept it and we reorganize our realities and there's a lot of learning and there's a lot of wisdom and there's a lot of meaning and understanding. And these are higher level processes because it's further down the train. And then we are able to move on. So if you're going through grief, maybe you've gone through a divorce. Um, maybe you have uh, lost a relationship to a conflict. Maybe you've lost a job or a career or a dream. You know, sometimes some of the biggest griefs we ever go through are when we lose things that we never had. It's something we desire and we're working towards. Just because you don't have something doesn't mean you can't grieve something. One of the biggest things you ever see is when people have to grieve dreams. You know, I live in Los Angeles and um, I don't mean this in a pejorative way in any form or fashion. Um, it's just a real thing. I mean, you know, people experience this in other ways and places all the time, but, but it's interesting sometimes because I live in LA um, that I meet a lot of actors, right? But the particular actor I'm talking about is not always on the screen. You meet a lot of actors in LA because you go to restaurants and when they're first starting out, they move here from wherever and they're going to build an acting career. They got a dream, right? And they got to have a job. So a lot of them work in restaurants. Very interesting, very engaging, very lovely, fun people. Love, love, love when you run into the actors in restaurants because they're kind of on a lot of times anyway. But what's interesting is I always, I like talking to people and say, so, so um, how long you been here? You know, where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. And so sometimes you'll talk to somebody that uh, is a server somewhere. And I say, so how long have you been at the restaurant? No, well, this really isn't, isn't what I do. You know, I'm I'm an actor. And <clears throat> I'll say, um, oh, really? What what are you working on? You know, how long have you been doing it? And they'll say, well, you know, I've got a few things going. And it always kind of sounds like nothing's really happening, right? It's sort of like, like, yeah, I've got this meeting coming up or, you know, I'm working on a script or but nothing's really happened. And I say, so how long have you been doing this? And I've I've heard like, you know. 30 years, 35 years, and it's never taken off. Well, a lot of times we have dreams and we have desires and we have fantasies that we're going to do something. And reality tells us at some point, this probably is not going to happen. Now, obviously you got to balance that with perseverance, right? But at some point, reality is telling us it's time for the doctor to pull the mask and put the paddles down. We can't bring this dream back. It's not going to happen. And sometimes people hold on to dreams too long because it's a failure to grieve. They don't want to go into the grief process and accept it and grieve and move on. And part of life is reinventing ourselves. One of the hardest, hardest things like that that I ever went through was I had a dream. Um, I went into practice, you know, I was still in graduate school and I started really, really young. I was four years old, sort of. Um, but I did start young because I'd had a lot of experience in college and, and right after. And so I, I went into practice while I was still in graduate school and was in practice for a handful of years. And I had a dream. My dream was I wanted to start a a psychiatric hospital that um, where faith was welcome and where people we could have pastors on the floor and you know prayer groups for healing and and along with all the best psychiatric treatment in the world 
And so I, that was a dream and I worked on it. I'd worked on it for about a year and a half before I went out and raised the money from investors to buy a hospital. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. I was in my twenties, but <laughs> Hey, why not? Let's go buy a hospital. Well, we did, you know, and I raised the investment group and had all the programming and all that. And we went out to, to, we were trying to buy, buy a hospital and no one would sell in those days because they were, you know, just going to wells. And, and, and so I changed the model a little bit and then I went into existing uh, med surge hospitals and I'd go to a big med surge hospital and say, do you have a wing that's underperforming like a surgery wing or a post-op surgery wing or a peds wing or, you know, something. And hospitals a lot of times would have wings that were, you know, they weren't, really being utilized and I would and I say well I'll convert it to psych I'll take it through the licensure process at the state level I'll bring the doctors I'll bring the patients to do the programming and all of that and so that's what we did and John Townsend joined me and we did our first hospital and it worked and it was great and my dream I, I've never had so much fun as having this faith field psych unit it was doing incredible things. Outside research was presented at the American Psychological Association with the results we got. We were training psych residents, um, psychiatry residents, psych interns, a lot of stuff. It was so much fun. And then that one worked and we did another one and then we did another one and then we did another one. We ended up with treatment centers and, and psych units in 40 different cities in the Western states. And ran that company for about, you know, a long time, 10 or 12 years. That's what I thought my life was going to be. And all the materials that we were developing there started publishing. And so we could get them out to the general public. That's some of the books that you have read. Well, all of a sudden, and I mean, all of a sudden, it went like that. This thing called managed care moved into the healthcare system. And basically said, we're, insurance companies said, we're not going to pay for psych anymore. And so we had built an entire, I mean, years and years had gone into this, an entire system and company, you know, a couple of hundred doctors and so many employees and nurses. And, and I mean, it was just, it was my life's work. And within a year, the psych industry just went away because insurance companies said, we're not going to pay for inpatient psych anymore. So for two or three days, if you've ever had a family member, you know this in recent years. And so I lost my dream. And it was really hard, really, really hard. But through the grief process, what I had to do was hold on to what the essence was, even if the way that I lived out the essence was dead. The essence was I wanted to help people, right? And I wanted to work with faith and, and psychological concepts and all this kind of stuff. And when it came out the other end, holding on to that with that dream gone, then I had to find new ways to do that. And I think that's true for you. See, I think whether it's holding on to love, you're going to take love past the divorce. You're going to take love past, if you're single, that breakup you just went through. You're going to take love and relationship past that dysfunctional family member that has cut you out of their life or that you've had to cut out for whatever reasons. Whatever it is, you've got to find in your heart the essence that is life-giving that you're going to take past grief. But you've got to face the grief to clear the space for that essence to have a new beginning somewhere, a new beginning somewhere. And I'll close with this, one of my favorite Bible verses. Um, <laughs> when God, and he tells this story a few times, uh, uh, Jesus says there's two or three versions and parables of stories where he tells that, and, and I'll translate it, but you know, God's up in heaven and he says, Hey, I want all these people to come and join me, you know, be in my family. And so he sends the workers out. He says, you're going to have a big party. We're going to have a big banquet. And he sends out all these invitations and people said, no, I'm too busy, you know, or no, I got this going on or thanks for the invite, but, but, but and they start to give all these excuses. 
and the workers come back and said, they're not saying yes to you. And he said, well, because he was looking for his own people, you know, he's looking for in the beginning, you know, he's, 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 he's going to the house of Israel. And then he says, well, I'm unhappy about that. That's the grief. And he says, well, then go out and fill, fill the banquet with other people. And he adopted the rest of the world. Holding on to the essence of love and relationship, but when he's turned down, he doesn't give up on love and relationship. He goes out and finds that. If you come from a family of origin that has failed you and that happens, don't give up on love. Don't give up on relationship. Grieve. Grieve what you didn't have, but go out and invite some other people to the party that you're going to have called life. And same way in any other relationship that you've lost or your career. Okay.